But anyway, my contention is that the so-called Ebionites of the second century CE, so now, you know, the beginning of the post-apostolic period, yeah. they were the spiritual inheritors of those Jamesonian Nazarenes who opposed Paul during the early period. And of course, uh, F.C. Bauer is explicit about this. Uh, there's a book um, called, uh, which I recommend, it's called, it's a compendium, it's called a companion, to, a companion to Second Century Christian Heretics, it's published by Brill, and there's a section in there on Ebionites, and an author named uh, Sekarai Hakinen. Uh, I don't know if it's a male or a female, I don't want to misgender them, there's only two genders by the way. Anyway, uh, so Hakinen says, the, the Ebionites emphasize, this is a quote, the Ebionites emphasize their lineage. The, uh, the Ebionites e emphasize their lineage was from the earliest Christianity in Jerusalem. Many you, scholars. If, huh? if I, just to interrupt, uh, Bart Ehrman has produced uh, a very readable uh, compendium uh, of early, the earliest Christian writings outside of the New Testament, which contains all of these uh, uh, um, apostolic um, uh, texts that you you refer to from the second century, and even the, the uh, yeah, that's actually not the one, but it, that that is another one. Um, uh, but yes, that that as well. So, uh, but but if all these kind of resources, Bart Ehrman has uh, has produced in a very uh, accessible and readable form as well. But uh, sorry, I just wanted yeah. to mention that to everyone. No, thank you, thank you for that. Yeah. So the Ebionites emphasize their lineage was from the earliest Christianity in Jerusalem. Many scholars yeah. have suggested that the Ebionites preserved the early traditions and ideas more faithfully than any other Christian movement. Yes. This suggestion is based on a hypothesis that there are more or less clear parallels between the Ebionite religion and the early Jerusalem Christianity. And Ehrman makes this point as well. Ehrman says, how ironic is it that the mm -hmm. Ebionites were declared uh, heretics by yep. the proto-Orthodox when they represent the earliest Christianity? The Orthodox view, exactly. Exactly. And I must say, but Bart Ehrman is often seen as an outlier, as a kind of radical, dangerous. But if you read mainstream uh, Christian New Testament scholarship, they say exactly the same thing. For example, Jimmy Dunn in his book uh, Unity and Diversity, which is to do with the uh, condition of the early Christi Christianities in the first century, this is exactly the same thing. And multiple other scholars do too. So this is mainstream scholarship that is simply not known about outside of academia as one of the reasons why it's so important uh, dr ali that you uh share this information because yeah. um you know it's mainstream in, in academia but it's not known uh, amongst yeah. christians widely i think if you go to the christian on the street you know the average christian parishioner and you say have you heard of the ebionites i mean they would have <laughs> little to no idea what you were talking probably never even heard of them yeah Here's the thing also about the Ebionites. Unfortunately, all of our information about them, their beliefs, their Christology, their supposed scriptures, all of that comes to us through their theological rivals, the proto and then orthodox Christian polemicists and heresiologists. And often their statements contradict. So we have to take their claims and appraisals about the Ebionites with a grain of salt. So, so the term Ebionite, it, yeah. It's mysterious, but it was probably invented by the proto-Orthodox as a way of disparaging any Christian group who continued to cling to a theologically and legally Jewish orientation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now concern and love for the poor, the Evyonim, was no doubt a cornerstone of the early Jamesonian Nazarenes. This is even intimated by Paul in Galatians 2.10. Jesus, of course, said, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. So the virtue of spiritual poverty, that is like a, a recognition of one's absolute need for God, was likely highly praised by the Jamesonian adherents. The, the pseudonymous author of, of the epistle of James says emphatically, remember the poor, remember the poor. However, according to Eusebius, in his ecclesiastical history, he says the ancients, meaning the pro-Pauline fathers of the post-apostolic church, the ancients referred to the Jewish Christians as the poor ones, the Evionim, because they, quote, held poor and low opinions concerning yeah. Christ. I had, well, I don't know Christology, uh, so you know. yeah. I mean, Origen yeah. said Origen said it's because of the poverty of their understanding. So the yeah. so the Porto Orthodox were saying in effect that the Jewish Christians' real poverty was not spiritual. 
No. But intellectual and doctrinal. In other words, the Jewish Christian Nazarenes, now disparagingly called the Ebionites, mm -hmm. espoused a simple and low Christology. Really, a Christology devoid of Greek metaphysics. Mm -hmm. That's why they're complaining, right? A thoroughly Tanakhi, a thoroughly Jewish Christology. But then who invented the term Ebionite? It's hard to tell. Justin Martyr, who is called the father of Logos Christology, uh, he spoke of Jewish Christians. There's no doubt about that, but he never used the term Ebionite. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in the writings of none other than Irenaeus, right? right? The heresiologist extraordinaire, where the term Ebionites, right? Ebionioi first appeared. And it's interesting also, Justin Martyr, when he quotes the Gospels, he just calls them the memoirs of the apostles. Yeah. Right? He doesn't actually name them. Uh, but then 30 years later, Irenaeus, Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So what happened between you know Justin Martyr and Irenaeus between 150 and 180 is you have this uh, basically this proliferation of, of different Gospels claiming to have been written by apostles. So at this point, Irenaeus, a proto-Orthodox father, decided, well, it, we need to have books that have some sort of uh, apostolic authorship uh, yeah. um, uh, um, attributed to them. So he started naming these things. So, so we're actually faced with several problems uh, in, in our quest to retrieve the original and accurate Christology of the Ebionites at the beginning of the post-apostolic period. So again, our first problem is what? Our first problem is a lack of confessional Ebionite sources. Okay, we have nothing from the Ebionites themselves. Well, what about the pseudo Clementines? Are you going to come on to that? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll I'm sorry. There. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, we are forced to rely on the polemical writings of their mm -hmm. theological opponents. So this is in the early period. I mean, the, the pseudo Clementine literature is definitely Jewish Christian. Um, in its orientation, but that's a bit later, third, fourth century. Yeah. So during the sort of uh, early patristic period, we have nothing from the Ebionites, the, uh, from the period of, with the beginning of the post-apostolic period. So that, yeah. that's the first problem, okay? So it's like, you know, imagine, imagine a biography of Pope Francis uh, written by Richard Dawkins, right? <laughs> um, I don't think you're going to get a lot of... Um, no truthful information or accurate or unbiased information. So, so there's no doubt then, at least to a certain degree, that just as the Arians were misrepresented and outright slandered by the Orthodox, okay, mm -hmm. the Ebionites were as well. I mean, they would make up these things. It's kind of like what Paul says, you know, you know, it's kind of crude. You know, I think it was one of the Cappadocian church fathers. I think it was Gregory of Nyssa who said that, you know, Arius, he died on the toilet and things like that. This is just ridiculous slanders. Secondly, if we assume that the, even if we assume that the proto-Orthodox descriptions of the Ebionites were fairly accurate, uh, there's no doubt that within the broader Ebionite movement of the post-apostolic period, many theological differences emerged among competing Ebionite schismatics. Okay, for example, it is clear that the, Ebion, that the Ebionites that Epiphanius described in the Panorion in the late fourth century, mm -hmm. that they were of diverse opinions concerning Christology. Yep. Epiphanius even prefaces his descriptions with some of them say this, but others among them say that. So there's theological diversity even among the later Ebionites. Eusebius also uh, talks about this diversity in his Ecclesiastes. Yeah. That yeah. whole that whole period, the post-apostolic period, is yeah. marked with a massive proliferation of, of competing beliefs on yeah. both sides. So in yeah. this vein, the Quran says, ahzabu min But uh -huh. the Christian sects differed amongst themselves. Yeah. And then this verse is chronologically followed by another verse in which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is called a light, nurun. And the Quran is called kitabun mubin, a clear book. Or, or more literally, a book that causes clarity, right? So that after giving, uh, after giving us its Christology, the Quran says, <laughs> Such was Jesus, the son of Mary. It is a statement of truth, meaning the aforementioned described Christology. It is a statement of truth about which they, the Christian 
sectarians are vainly disputing. Yeah. So yeah. from a Islamic Christological perspective, okay, this is a really important point. From, from an Islamic Christological perspective, it seems to me that while the Quran is almost summarily repudiating the essential proto-Orthodox and subsequent Trinitarian positions, such as the divinity of Christ and his substitutionary atonement, it is simultaneously confirming the essential Ebionite position mm. that Jesus was a non-divine, law-abiding prophet messiah, while also confirming, refining, correcting, and rejecting particular aspects of Ebionism that had developed over time. So the Quran is separating the wheat from the chaff, as it were. The Quran is restoring the Christology of Jesus and his disciples that was passed unto the Jamesonian Nazarenes and then preserved to varying degrees among the many Ebionite groups uh, during the post-apostolic <coughs> period. But let's look at the writings of some of the church fathers here. Okay, so <clears throat> I thought this would be um, uh, helpful, beneficial to the, to the viewers. What, what do they say about the Ebionites? Again, this is this is coming from Christian, you know, proto-Orthodox authorities. Take hostile the, sources. These are hostile witnesses. They are not hostile uh, sources. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's interesting what they say. Yeah, let's let's look at it. So, according to Irenaeus, so he was the first one. He died two o two of the Common Era. Uh, he, the Ebionites used only a redacted version of Matthew's Gospel. Yeah, he says, the Ebionites repudiated the apostate Paul and his epistles yeah they call him an apostate not apostle they observed the customs enjoined by the torah they mm -hmm. adored jerusalem that was their base the deny they denied the virgin birth of jesus so remember that one okay that's uh, this going to irenaeus they denied the virgin birth we'll come back to this yep. they denied the divinity of the son they believed in the they believed in one supreme being who created the world. They believed in adoptionist Christology, which Irenaeus says was quote similar to Corinthus. They believed that Jesus's Christ spirit left him prior to his death. Again, according to Irenaeus, similar to Corinthus. So his spirit was lifted up by God prior to their murder of him, right? I call this divine rapture. We talked about this last time. This is actually what the gospel of Peter also teaches, although there are some problems uh, with that gospel. So that's according to Irenaeus. According to Tertullian of Carthage, who died 220, the Ebionites taught Jesus was a mere man. They denied that Jesus was the son of God in the Pauline sense. They believe that an angel was in Jesus, or rather with Jesus or helping Jesus. Possibly something that the Quran mentions. They believe that Jesus was a prophet, a Nebi like Jonas. That's according to Tertullian. According to Origen, die 253, the Ebionites believe that Jesus came only for the Jews. And he, he cites Matthew 15, 27, he says, thinks not, or he says, um, I have not been sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right? According to Origen, the Ebionites received Jesus as Christ, and they believed in the virgin birth of Jesus. So there was a difference of opinion among uh, so about... Origen, Origen says, Origen reports, and he, he was probably the greatest scholar of the early church, a uh, biblical scholar, that these Ebionites did believe in the virgin birth. They did. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to mention Christian polemicists on this for the similar reasons that you didn't mention them at the beginning. Um, but this is a really contentious issue. And uh, uh, many Christian polemicists would uh, vehemently um, be upset with what you've just said. But nevertheless, it is a fact. Uh, um, you're absolutely right. Yes, yes, that's what he says. And That's according right. to Eusebius, Eusebius, he, right? Yeah. He also uh, says that the that the Ebionites believe in the virgin birth, that they observed the Sabbath. He says, and they yeah. commemorated the resurrection of Jesus on Sunday. That they denied that Christ pre-existed as God, Word, and Wisdom. Now, 
the uh, most comprehensive treatment of the Ebionites comes with Epiphanius of Salamis mm -hmm. in his uh, Pan Orion. So he was the, the, the bishop uh, uh, of Crete, I believe. Uh, so here's something, here's what he says about the Ebionites. He says, some of them, some of them believed that Christ was a purely spiritual being, the first of creation who was above the angels. He says, some of them believed that Adam was Christ and that he would put on Adam's body when he appeared to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So these beliefs are clearly, I would say, wrong from an Islamic standpoint. It's interesting, the Quran does mention Jesus and Adam in a single verse. In the Mathala Isa in the Lahika Mathali Adam, Khalaqahu min Turab, Thumma Kalalahu kun fayakun. The similitude of Jesus before God is like that of Adam. He created him from dust, then said to him, be, and, and, and he was. So yeah. the Quran says that Adam and Jesus are similar only in the sense that they're both created by God. This might mm -hmm. be some sort of corrective of, of this type of Christology that, that Epiphanius is describing. Mm -hmm. And then he says that the, that the Ebionites maintained that a celestial spirit called Christ infused itself with the human Jesus after it descended in the form of a dove. And that Jesus is called son of God by election or promotion, yet he was a mere man who, owing to the virtue of his life, has come to be called the son of God. In other words, the title son of God for the Ebionites, according to Epiphanius, is honorific. It's takrimi, and that's exactly what Imam al-Razi says was its original usage. It's not yep. meant to be literal, right? She was. She was. Yeah, it, it's not due to being pre-eternally begotten from the very essence of the Father. This is completely foreign to the period of the New Testament. It comes from the fourth century. That was, yeah. Yeah. that was read into the New Testament. It's completely anachronistic. What else does he say? He says that the Ebionites believed that Christ was a prophet of truth, right? Or you can say a true prophet, a Navi Emmet, a prophet Messiah. Uh -huh. And possibly not a king messiah or a priest messiah. My contention is that the Quran contends that Jesus was a prophet messiah. What else? They removed the Davidic genealogy from Matthew's gospel. Really? Kind of interesting. This is what he mentions in Panorama 13, 14, mm -hmm. 3. Why did they do that? Maybe because they did not believe that Jesus was from David. Mm -hmm. um, he says that they do not accept the whole Pentateuch of Moses but leave passages aside. Well, why is that? Well, either Jesus made certain adjustments or updates to the law. This is actually mentioned in the Quran. Yeah. I have come to confirm the Torah, but also to make certain things that were impermissible, permissible. And that's the affair of a prophet. He can do that because he's endowed with the power of the authority of God to do that. Uh, so maybe this is what it means. Or Jesus exposed certain fabrications in the law oh. and reformed things. And That's James, James Tabor uh, agrees with the latter. Or it could be both of these things, that Jesus yeah. made certain amendments and adjustments as well as reformations that were... Or yes, no, sorry, in your forthcoming monograph, uh, these are really useful uh, references to alleged Ebionite beliefs. So will, will, will these be uh, listed? Uh, yes, before? definitely. I'm, I'm going to list it, it's a very useful resource for people to have. Yeah. Yes, I will list these things. And right. then he mentions a few more things. Epiphanius of Salams, he says, they observed various purity rituals. They forbade uh, celibacy and virginity. He says they were vegetarians, which is interesting. Yeah. Because they call their churches synagogues, not churches, because they were Jews. And then he said, the last thing he mentions is kind of interesting. <laughs> it, it seems a bit fanciful uh, to me, but he says that the Ebionites bring a charge against Paul. They declare that he is of Greek descent. He is a Greek, the child of a Greek mother and a Greek father. Uh -huh. That he went up to Jerusalem and stayed there for a time. That he desired to marry the daughter of a priest and therefore became a proselyte and that he had himself circumcised, and that since he could not receive such a girl as his wife, he became angry 
and wrote against circumcision, the Sabbath, and the law. Hmm. So, so this seems to be sort of a highly sort of vitriolic polemic against Paul, where, he, where he's basically saying that some of the Ebionites believe that Paul faked everything because he was yeah. bitter about not being able yeah, to, uh, to marry a certain Jewish woman. I guess love drives you crazy, I guess. Uh, but Richard Bachman, I'll just mention, just to finish up here, oh, Richard, Bachman, yeah. Richard Bachman, he says that the Ebionites, that although the Ebionites believe that Jesus died and was resurrected, his death was not interpreted by the Ebionites as a substitutionary vicarious atonement. Rather, Jesus died as a moral exemplar in order to move people to atonement through repentance. Back to Luke again. Yes, that's Luke, yeah. Many Ebionites also believe that, that Jesus ended the entire institution of animal sacrifices by being the ultimate sacrifice. Again, not in the Christian sense of sacrifice. So you say the word sacrifice, the Christians say, ah, sacrifice, he died for your sins. No, his sacrifice set a moral example for us to emulate. That's what they mean by that, right? So like the Mathean Jesus, he said, uh, quoting Hosea, he said, ki chesed chafatzti velo zavach v'da'at Elohim me'oloth. He said, Go and learn what this means. I require mercy, right. not sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. It's about the mercy of God and the knowledge of God. It's not about sacrifice anymore. Okay. Now, I mentioned that the Ebionites used an edited version of Matthew's gospel. Okay, this is what, this is what Irenaeus says. A very intriguing question is this. And I want people to think about this. Did the Matthean Jesus, did the Jesus of Matthew, warn his disciples about people like Paul and Pauline Christians? Because there's evidence in the New Testament that he likely did. So both Matthew and Luke, okay, so taking from Q, recorded the parable of the tree and its fruit and the parable of the two foundations. Now, keep in mind that much of the material in Q is believed to have been composed either during or prior to Paul's composition of his epistles. Okay, so the Q source material, at least in its initial strata, uh, has not been contaminated, as it were, by Pauline Christology. So the Matthean Jesus begins the parable of the, of the tree and its fruit like this. He says, Beware of false prophets, those who come to you in sheep's clothing and are inwardly ravenous wolves. Now, later in Matthew, Jesus described his disciples as being, quote, sheep among the wolves. So from these, two, from these verses alone, we observe that the wolves are what? They're duplicitous. They're hypocritical. They are in the guise of the sheep, meaning the guise of apostles of Jesus. And they pronounce false, that is to say, unfulfilled prophecies. Now, I would say that Paul is three for three here. He admitted to the Corinthians that he followed the law when he was in the company of Jews in order to deceive them into thinking that he considered adherence to the law mandatory. According to Acts, he even deceived James. Exactly. Well, he bought, he bought false witness, actually. Uh, yeah. Bore false witness. But when he was in the company of Gentiles, he would abandon the law and exactly. live as one lawless. This is how he describes himself, a nomos. Yeah. He uses the term a nomos, lawless. Keep that term in mind. Mm -hmm. Secondly, despite him never spending a minute of time with the historical Jesus, Paul presented himself as a bona fide apostle of Jesus who was no more inferior than any other apostle. He, has he, had, Jesus. he actually yeah. refer, he, he, ref, he referred to James and Peter as so-called pillars. Is this how you talk about <laughs> James, the brother of, of Jesus? James, the righteous? James, the, the saint? 